one day the Holy Spirit showed me through uh, concordances and through study and through instruction the meaning of the word repentance. And it changed my whole life. Look, what is it we're calling people to do in our evangelism? We're to call men to repent. But what's that mean? What are you asking them to do? I mean, I could get into a sermon right here on this, but I won't. But, you know, change your mind. Change your mind about what? Change your mind about what you think you know about salvation. Remember John the Baptist and Jesus came along calling men to repent. And for example, they said, you think that because you're children of Abraham, right? Then you're good. Okay. But judgment is coming and you're not ready. I got to get you to change your thinking. Why? If you keep thinking that way, you won't be ready for the judgment. You know how many people in our generation think that because they prayed a prayer at some time that they're good? It doesn't matter what happens. Even if they don't fear God, they don't follow God, they don't go on believing. But they're fine. They don't even have to worry about judgment. And if a lot of people think they're going into the rapture. They're not even going to go in the rapture. Okay. What are we called to do? What are you called to do? We're called to call men to change their mind. Repent. It's a compound word, re, again, pent, think, think again about what you think you know. The Lord showed me there's six billion people in the world, and part of being a person since you're made in the image of God is that you have to, even if you're an atheist, you have to work out for yourself some kind of plan of salvation. So if there's six billion people in the world, there's six billion plans of salvation. The problem is, most of them are wrong. I mean, as a Catholic, I thought, well, look, I don't think I'll go to heaven. I'm not good enough. I don't think I'll go to hell. I'm not bad enough. I think I'll go to purgatory. You know how many people are going to go to hell because of that? If I would have died in that state, then Jesus made me think again. Repent. The word Metanoia uh, is a compound word, Greek word. Metanoia, noia, that's your mind. Uh, paranoia, right? Just because you're paranoid, it doesn't mean they're not out to get you. <laughs> well, metanoia means change your mind. Change your mind. The Hebrew word, teshuva, turn around. We get into this in this book. I think this is a very valuable book. Can't get anyone to read it, but I think it's a great book, all right? <laughs> if nothing else, prop up that kitchen table with a short leg, all right? <laughs> Go to Matthew chapter 24. Let me read a passage very familiar to you, and let me talk about it for a minute here. Matthew 24. Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, Don't you see all these things? Verily I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming, and of the end of the age? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars, and see that you be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. And all these are the beginning of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise, and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then shall the end come. 
When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, and whoever reads, let him understand. Then let those which are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. And woe to them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. Pray that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not seen since the beginning of the world to this time, no nor shall ever be. He's quoting Daniel. Great tribulation that the world has never seen before. Think about it, people. The Holocaust, the horrors of the ancient world. The, the, you, we could go through history. It is terrible. Things have happened. Jesus said, look, at a certain point, tribulation's coming on this world that the world's never seen before, and it'll never see again. He says in another place, unless the Lord shortened those days, no one would survive. I mean, <laughs> this is the thing I'm trying to jar people all over the world out of their complacency. A terrible, terrible trial is coming. And people have to get ready. And primary getting ready is being aware and getting right with God. Make sure that your sins are forgiven you. Make sure that there's nothing between you and God. First thing I want to talk about is the timing of uh, the coming of Jesus and John the Baptist into the world. Okay, well, you think about it. Jesus and John the Baptist came to Israel 40 years before the worst judgment that they had ever experienced came upon them. Something worse than the Babylonian captivity, if you can imagine. 40 years before the worst judgment that they had ever experienced, God sent Jesus and John the Baptist preaching repentance. Okay. I think that's a really important thing to take into mind before you even look at this passage, before you look at this chapter. You'll understand the context that Jesus and John the Baptist were in every sense end times, last days preachers, warning people of a terrible tribulation that was going to come. So, how bad? So bad was the tribulation that came upon them that the temple was destroyed. The nation was sold into the slave markets of the world. A million Jews were slaughtered. And the nation of Israel went out of existence for more than uh, almost 2,000 years. Only lately, in most of your lifetimes, there's people here that were alive in 1948. In your lifetime, a miracle happened. A nation that had been taken out, absolutely taken out, which that's no miracle. A lot of nations have been taken out. Anyone meet a Hittite lately? Anyone work with a Philistine or something like that? Many nations have been taken out. Many nations have been dispersed. Many nations have been assimilated into the whole world. But Israel is a miracle. I can't emphasize that enough. I'm going to tell you something that I've been telling people lately because the Lord just showed it to me so strong. You, you think that you saw the Red Sea, you'd never doubt again, right? If you saw the Red Sea split, a nation go through the Red Sea on dry land, a whole nation, and then just at the right time it closes on the enemies of that nation and drowns them, the horse and rider is thrown into the sea. You think, man, I've seen a miracle. I'll never doubt again. But here's what I think. I think the resurrection of Israel in May 1948 is a greater miracle than what happened at the Red Sea. Like I say, many nations have been taken into slavery. Many nations have been wiped out. Many nations have been taken into captivity. Many nations have been obliterated. But this nation was kept in state for 2,000 years. And then in fulfillment of the words of this nation's prophets, brought back together again, and a nation born again in a day. You that were alive in 1948, you have seen a miracle greater than the miracle of the Red Sea. Israel 
is a miracle. Now, <clears throat> that's the first part of the context. I mean, think about the preaching, like I was just telling you earlier, John the Baptist and Jesus. These people aren't ready for the judgment. In the Babylonian captivity, they've been cured of idolatry. You didn't see any Baal worship or anything like that in the first century. They, so that was done. It was over. They couldn't get far enough away from idols. They hated idols. They did not want anything to do with idols. But what is idolatry anyway, spiritually, but alienation from God? In other words, it's possible to be just as far from God. And that's what happened. Jesus and John the Baptist came along saying, look, there is judgment coming. You cannot believe what's coming on you. You are not ready. You better repent. I mean, what the whole thing of them going out of the promised land and then lining up at the River Jordan and then going back in the promised land on the preaching of John. What are they doing? What are they doing? Well, Israel is a holy nation, and the whole world is supposed to go there and learn of God right but they're so estranged and alienated from God that you're actually worse off for going there so there were people there were was a remnant that heard the preaching and by going outside across the Jordan and coming back over the Jordan of the preaching of John they're saying we're starting all over we're going to go back and come back the right way. There was a remnant. And that remnant, as history says, escaped on the eve of the judgment. The other thing is that um, Matthew 24 takes place in the context of uh, it's, the, it's the Passover week. It's the Passover week, and as everyone, uh, every season, for example, I'll, I'll use Christmas, okay? Now, don't judge me about using Christmas, okay? I'll just use an example. Well, every December, people sing the same songs, right? Silent night, holy night. It's a Christmas carol. You can sing that song anytime you want. It's one of the most beautiful songs ever written, I think. But, you know, people sing it around Christmas, right? Well, the Jews had uh, songs that were for Passover. Okay. And one of the, uh, it's, a, it's, the, it's the Psalms section, that 112 to 118. One, Psalm 118 is, is a major, major uh, song that they sang that time of year. And, you know, I, I remember when I was a boy, uh, singing Christmas carols all as a child, and I couldn't have told you what they meant. Okay, hark the herald angels sing. Well, I don't know what a herald is. I don't know, a, you know what, but it's just part of the season, so you just sing it. You know, glory to the newborn king. So I sing these songs for years. Our family sat around and sang songs. Okay, but then when I got born again. And I didn't even realize this. One day I'm singing, Hark the herald angels sing, Glory to the newborn king, Born to save the sons of earth, Born to give us second birth. All of a sudden I went, Whoa! I didn't know I was singing about being born again. It just went off. You know what I'm saying? It just went off. The scriptural things that I'd sang for years and didn't even have a concept. Okay, so you sing Psalm 118. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord, we sing it too, don't we? Okay, uh, that the Lord has made, that the Lord has made, or you sing, save now, O Lord, we beseech thee, Hosanna, send prosperity. They sing these songs every year, Passover. Only the thing is that leads to Matthew 24 is that this was the day that the Lord had made. You understand what I'm saying? Not a general day. I mean a calendar day. See, Daniel told us 
Daniel 9, the exact day Jesus would present himself, Messiah of Israel, present himself to Israel. And there's parts of the song that says, we bless you out of the house of the Lord. We bless you. And the, see, one guy goes, open to me the gates of righteousness, that the righteous may come in. And then other people say, we bless you out of the house of the Lord. And then they sing, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. You could sing that for years. And you can like it. You can love it. You can sing it in your sleep and not even know what's going on. Because the thing is that the events of Matthew 24 occurred on the day that the Lord had ordained. It's like a drama. It's like he comes closer and closer to the temple. You sing also, the stone that the builders rejected. It's the cornerstone. What are you singing? I don't know what that means. He comes closer and closer and closer to the temple. And they're supposed to say, we bless you out of the house of the Lord. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. But on that day, Jesus came to the house of the Lord as the prophets foretold and as the song anticipated and the delegation that was there did not receive the Messiah they did not say blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord not at all see this is part of the context of Matthew 24 and has to be taken into account. It's, uh, uh, he already warned them earlier. He's on the way to the temple. This is another misunderstood thing. He sees a, cur a fig tree with leaves. And he says, there's got to, you know, there's got to be fruit. You, you've heard these teachings before in many ways. A fig tree, if it has leaves, it must have fruit. So the fig tree has leaves, no fruit. Jesus picks up leaves because it says he's hungry. None, no, no fruit, none whatsoever. And so to his disciples' amazement, he curses the fig tree. And they're shocked and wonder. And then when they come by the next day, the thing's cursed. It's dead. No man eat fruit of you from here on ever. It withered up by the next day. You, you amazed by this? I'm paraphrasing. Whoever says to this mountain, be thou removed, and be thou cast in the sea, and won't doubt or believes what he says will come to pass. He'll have whatever he says. Well, I used to belong to a, a semi-Christian sub-sect called the Word of Faith Movement. Anyone know what that is? The whole thing is based on that verse. But it's all based on the distortion of that verse. And we said, well, God speaks it so you can speak it. And God cursed the fig tree. You speak to your circumstances. And we missed the whole point. It's the Messiah of Israel. And the fig tree is the symbol of the blessing of God on Israel. And the fig tree with leaves is a pronouncement. It's the confession of faith in God. But no fruit. How many parables are there about fruit? You know, he's always looking for fruit. He comes, he get, the fig tree that gets, uh, that grows for three years. He said, where's the fruit? Where's the fruit? And the, in another place he says, cut it down. It, it, don't let it take up the ground anymore. Cut it down. There's no fruit. And the gardener in the story, he intercedes for the fig tree. The only thing between the fig tree and an axe is a lowly gardener who says, hey, please, give it another chance. A year? I'll dung it. I'll fertilize it. Anyone here feel like you've been dunged lately? It's the Lord. But that parable says, no, it won't go on forever. It won't go on forever. There comes a time of reckoning. There comes a time when it's over. No fruit. What is fruit? Look, let me just simplify, demystify. What fruit? What is fruit? Fruit, true love for God, repentance, true faith. I'm not talking about, you know, humanistic love. I mean really loving God. Do you love God? 
Have you turned? Do you love the world? You love God. He comes looking for fruit. And everything in the, I don't want to mix up the parables, but everything in the parable with the gardener, everything he did was calculated to totally incline that fig tree to bear fruit. He brought the rocks out of the soil. He brought the good soil in. He fertilized. He nurtured. He had a gardener. He put up a fence. Everything is calculated to bring forth fruit. But no, he comes for fruit and no fruit. No faith. No love. I'm talking real faith. I'm talking real love for God or for each other. This is just cut it down. And man, the only thing keeping that, see this, that word was a warning. Now, when I read that parable, I think, gosh, why was I born in America and not Saudi Arabia? What did my mother and father teach me about God? They were Catholic, but they really did teach us about God. They taught me to pray. They taught me there's a God above. They taught me there's a judgment to come. They taught me stories about Jesus. And I was given these little books called arch books, Bible stories. And this is the, and now I look at it and think, you did everything, Lord, to set me up, to incline me, to calculate me as an individual, to come to some point in my life. Where I turn to you and hate my sins and believe and love Jesus Christ. This is the meaning of the parable of victory and, and of and the vineyard. Now, to come back to the context of Matthew 24, he sees the fruit. There's no man eat fruit of you from here. It's a warning. And the mountain? No, not just any mountain. And no, he's not giving believers the power to just speak their reality. He's in the name of God as a prophet of God and making a reference to the most sacred piece of real estate on earth, a holy mountain where God dwelt. See, that's another thing about Israel that makes it an incredible miracle. This place where God in heaven, literally sanctified a piece of real estate and came down, gave them instructions to build a holy house. And then he descended from heaven in a holy cloud and dwelt in the midst of the people and inaugurated a worship that the ends of the earth were supposed to come and learn of God. And the nation was animated by that worship for God dwelled in the midst of them, right? Jesus said, look, this mountain is going to be removed and cast into the sea. The sea? The Gentiles. Now, Benjamin Netanyahu recently uh, was talking about this very subject because the United Nations, if there's ever a satanic organization, it's the United Nations. It's from the devil itself. And they have UNESCO, United Nations Educational, Social, and Cultural Educational Organization, which is the, supposedly the custodians of historic sites. Now, they had already decreed that the tomb of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Sarah, and Leah were Muslim shrine. Then they declared that the tomb of Rachel, the mother of Joseph and Benjamin, that's a Muslim shrine. And then just, just recently, they decreed that the Temple Mount is a Muslim shrine. And Benjamin Netanyahu said, look, I just invite UNESCO to go to Rome and look at the Arch of Titus. And you can see what they took off that holy mountain, the glorious candelabra of God. It's not a Muslim shrine. That was the place of the holy house, the Temple of God. But when Jesus said the mountain will be removed and cast into the sea, he's warning them that the temple and its establishment will be uprooted and that the nation itself would be dissolved in the Gentiles until the time. I remember 1967, I'm wandering, but bear with me. Uh, Moshe Dayan took Jerusalem. 
and the soldiers, this classic film picture of weeping at the Wailing Wall. They, they've been saying for centuries, next year in Jerusalem, this first time they could be in Jerusalem. They're weeping and wailing. And I can remember, and I wasn't even very old, but my family was very politically aware. Moshe Dayan turned it back over to the Jordanian Waqf, put the Temple Mount, the holiest place uh, to the Jews, under custody of Muslims. Now I wondered about that for years until I remembered the words of Jesus. Listen, Jerusalem shall be trodden under foot of the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles shall be fulfilled. So this is the, this is the uh, setting for Matthew 24. You've got to remember the place of Jesus and John the Baptist in history, in world history, and in salvation history, that they came 40 years from the absolute last judgment that was so devastating. It's only been in some of our lifetime that's even begun to be reversed. And after almost 2,000 years, a nation that was obliterated has been reconstituted, brought back into their land. Of course, an unbelief. It's the context. The warning of the cursed fig tree and of the mountain cast into the sea, the preaching of John the Baptist, the repentance, the place of uh, Jesus and John the Baptist, the song, this is the day, this is the day. We bless you out of the house of the Lord. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. It's the song they sang every year, as familiar to them as Silent Night, Holy Night is to some of us. Saturated in it, but not realizing that that was the day. Now, uh, another thing about this sermon and its context, you, you've got to take into account this fiery sermon of Matthew 23. The Messiah of Israel in his capacity as Messiah in his last public appearance in the temple of God addressing the leaders of the nation and I mean it is it is a denunciation that just sends shivers down my spine I believe it's timeless too I believe it could just as well apply to the church today as ever if God if God did what he did to Israel do you think the church could be better he says, don't call anyone your father. There's one father in heaven. you got most of the church calling the Pope the Holy Father. <laughs> Are you kidding? I, 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 words fail me. The apostasy. The horrifying apostasy. A, pa a mega church pastor in New York recently announced, you do not need to be born again to have a personal relationship with God and Jesus Christ. An evangelical publishing house published a book about how Christian singles can have satisfying sex lives. Well, I wonder if there's something wrong with me sometimes. This is like a bad dream. It's surreal. Actually, I ache and tremble. I'm worried, really, especially for the younger generation. Oh, God, what's going to happen to them? Anyway, let me move on with this context. Uh, it's <laughs> it's it's like he says they turned the temple into a den of thieves right you know he got that from jeremiah 7 jeremiah gave a temple speech in uh, very similar and he called he was calling israel to repent and and the thing that strikes me and i've often thought about this since because i'm living it and so are you and the church world's living it you turn the temple into the den of thieves you say the temple of the lord the temple of the lord like you're safe it's good we got the temple of the lord and basically he goes on to say, the temple of the Lord is only inviolable as long as God lives there. I thought about what does it mean to turn the temple of the Lord into a den of thieves? Now some people say, well, that's because they did so many crimes in the temple of the Lord. But in meditating on that, I realized, you know what? Thieves don't do their crimes in their dens. They do their crimes outside their dens. Then why do they go to their dens? They go to their dens because that's where you feel secure. You know how many Christians think they're good and secure because they prayed a prayer at one time? They don't really fear God. They live for themselves. They'll listen to false prophets. They will follow after their own lusts. <laughs> and yet, 
They feel so good. They turn the temple into a den of thieves. They turn the church into a den of thieves. You feel secure there. It's good. You're all right. You're covered. You're going in the rapture. You're not ready. Jesus is trying to tell Israel, you're not ready. So in the end, you know, he says two things that I really want to focus on before I close. And this is the last thing he said to them, and this is the setting, the true setting of Matthew 24. First, he says, verse 37, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you that kill the prophets and stone them which are sent unto thee. How often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathers her chickens under her wings, and you would not. By the way, that, that, that's, that's, that exposes extreme Calvinism. It's, it's an error. Because extreme Calvinism says if God wants to save you, then there's nothing you can do about it. It's going to be. Jesus said, no, I wanted to gather you under my wings. I wanted to shelter you from what's coming, but you wouldn't have it. I mean, you know, you got to want the Lord. And let me tell you something, even if it's basic, I'm still going to tell you in the name of God. You've got to love the Lord. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength. Cursed is everyone that doesn't love Jesus. you got to love Jesus. Now, we, don't, we can only love him because he first loved us. The child song can teach us the best. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first loved me. Whatever you love is what you're going to follow. Make sure you love the right thing. Whatever you love most of all is where you're going to go. So make sure that you give your love right. Don't love the wrong things. Or don't love anything less than God with all your heart, soul mind and strength. So Jesus said two things. Number one, verse 38. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. Now I want you to think about that. God doesn't live in this house anymore. God is not here anymore. <laughs> Whoa. This is a heavy, heavy deal. He's only echoing the prophets. Would you hold your finger in Matthew and go to Hosea chapter 5? See, they said the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. As long as we got the temple of the Lord, no one can touch us. Oh, the temple of the Lord is only inviolable as long as God's there. If God leaves. I mean, what good is a holy house without God? And by the way, what good is a holy nation without God? Well, what good would a worship service be without God or a Bible conference without God? I wouldn't even come here unless I believe there were two or more gathered together in my name. There am I in the midst of them. God is all we have and God is all we need. But we do need God. Do you believe that? Man, do we ever need God. Got to have God. You've got to abide in him. You got to stay close to him. This we are very close to the end. There is a terrible judgment coming. There are storm clouds gathering. We got to cling to God. Great pressures are coming to bear and a terrible religious test is coming that will test everyone. But God will give us the grace. We trust him. We're not strong, but he is. Amen. He says, uh, in Hosea chapter 5, or, well, we'll start in chapter 3. Now listen to this. Verse 4. The children of Israel shall abide many days without a king, without a prince, without a sacrifice, without an image, without an ephod, without teraphim. For many days, no nation, no king, no polity, no temple, no sacrifice. Oh, without teraphim. Oh, yeah, no idols. They got cured of idols. But they're just far from God. For many days. How many days? Even more than 70 years? Yes, even more. 70 AD to 1948? No nation of Israel? Unbelievable. But what then? Afterward. And dear friends, we're in afterward. We're in afterward. Things are happening. Okay. 
afterwards shall the children of Israel return. And I believe that this return has a twofold sense. Let me explain what I mean. Return physically and teshuva, return, repent. You know where we're at in time right now? Between those two returns. We're in afterward. We're in the last days. Israel is coming back to the land. But Israel has not come back to God yet. What's going to bring him to God? He says, Afterward shall the children of Israel return and seek the Lord their God and David their king, and they shall fear the Lord and his goodness in the last days. Now, by the way, I live for that day. Paul, the Apostle Paul said, if they're casting away, there's a benefit to us Gentiles. What will their coming again be? Nothing short but the resurrection from the dead for the whole world. Amen. How we know this world needs to be raised from the dead, right? But go skip with me to Hosea chapter 5. He gives us more. Verse 14, I will be unto Ephraim as a lion, and as a young lion to the house of Judah. I, even I, will tear and go away. I will take away, and no one will rescue him. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not the Romans. It's not the Babylonians. It's not the Persians. It's God. I, I, even I, shall tear. I, even I. And then verse 15 is maybe the most amazing verse in the Old Testament when you consider who's talking. I will go and return to the place from which I came until they acknowledge their offense singular and seek my face. In their affliction, they will seek me early. In what sense can God be said to go, for he's omnipresent. He's everywhere. How could God go? Only in this sense. He sanctified a holy piece of uh, real estate. He gave a holy plan for a holy house of worship. He came down from heaven in a cloud and inhabited the holy house. And they worshiped him there, didn't they? And he animated the nation. What nation is like that nation? But now he says, I'm leaving. I'm going. Ezekiel saw God leave the temple. He says, I saw it. The holy presence of God lifted up from the holy place. It lingered there for a little while. And then it moved over to the east gate. And then it moved to the Mountain of Olives and lingered there for a while. And then it went back, went back to heaven. He saw it. He saw it. It's almost like a fight between two lovers. I'm leaving! But you don't leave. Why? You wait a little while. Maybe there'll be a softening of the heart. Maybe a humble confession. Maybe asking for forgiveness. You wait. You linger. You stalk to the door. I'm leaving! But you don't leave. You hope for more dialogue, maybe a return, maybe softening of heart, maybe ask for forgiveness. You go to the curb, I'm leaving, but you don't leave right away. Maybe, just maybe, we don't have to leave. We can be reconciled. But when it's obvious, there's nothing. You get in the car and go away. And the Lord ascended from the holy place of the holy house and lingered. Ezekiel saw it. He went to the east gate and lingered. But there's no confession. And he went to the Mount of Olives and lingered. Nothing. And he went back to where he came from. I go to to the place for which I came until you acknowledge your offense. Uh, Jesus walked it out. Where, where is Matthew 23 take place? In the temple. Your house is left to you desolate. And then where did he go? 
Mount of Olives. And where did he go back to heaven from? The Mount of Olives. What good is a temple without God? What good is a holy nation without God? What good is worship without God? When does a church quit being a church? Dear Lord, we are in the last days. And then the second thing he said, which is severe, but also there is hope in it. You'll never see me again. You won't see me again. But I'm glad he didn't stop there. Until. Oh, you mean we will see him again? Yes, you will. You'll see him again. Well, what's the precondition for us seeing him again? Until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Wait a minute. We've been singing that all day. Yeah, but it didn't mean a word. You get it. You know what hurts me about our generation, especially about us confessing Christians? And it really does. They don't get it. They don't see. We got to pray. We got to be full of the Holy Ghost. We got to do what we can while we can, right? Then he left, verse 1 of Matthew, and then I'm going to close. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple. He left. His disciples are still in tourist mode. Man, can you believe this place? The stones were big. Jesus said, you see this place? The unthinkable is going to happen. You can't believe what's going to happen. Unthinkable thing is going to happen. Why, if you would have told me 20 years ago what we're living now, I'd go, no, really? Unthinkable. It's like I knew it was coming, but to see it come is unreal to me. It's unthinkable what's happening. What's up? Did you ever think that Muslims would pour into Europe and basically change the composition of the Western world? <laughs> and the leaders would want more of it? Did you ever think on 911 that Islam, instead of retreating and slinking away, would advance everywhere in the civilized world due to our leaders? Uh, Jesus, look at this temple. You see these stones? Not one stone will be left on another. Not one stone will be left on another. That's when they ask the three questions. When, when should these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming? And the third question. What's the sign of the end of the age? Thank you, everybody. The grace of God be with you.